Okay, thank you, Mark. Let's move along. The last working group report is genomic medicine, and Terry Manolio is going to give that report. She is the division director of genomic medicine at NHGRI. All right. Um, I actually am not the very last thing you have to do today. Uh, Rudy, Rudy still has an, an item, but I will try to be brief. Uh, and many thanks to the um, uh, Genomic Medicine Working Group members who I will credit here. None of them wanted to be the next to last thing on the agenda, so I'm doing the report. Um, so these are the, the members of the group. You can see them here. Um, and then we have five uh, NHGRI staff who also participate in the meetings. And many thanks to them for lots and lots of work. Um, the charge to the group is to assist in advising us through the advisory council on research needed to evaluate and move genomics into routine medical practice. And so we ask them to review current progress, identify research and education gaps and approaches for filling them, identify and publicize key advances, uh, plan genomic medicine meetings that help us to then identify research directions, and facilitate collaborations, coordination, and uh, availability of genomic resources. Um, looking specifically at publicizing key advances, uh, we actually spend a, a monthly uh, conference call reviewing um, uh, literature that uh, Janavi Narula, our, our program analyst, has skillfully pulled from um, the, the literature, and then deciding which of these meet our criteria, which I'll go into in a moment, um, for significant advances. Um, many thanks to our, our communications group and the web team in particular, uh, Makul Narakar, who um, then posts this in, in a searchable uh, database um, of, of these various advances. And you can see, uh, you can search it by title, author, you can filter it for category and dates, et cetera. The criteria that we use uh, include um, involving use of patients' genomic variant information in clinical decision making, uh, demonstrating the impact of either direct clinical implementation or the potential for clinical implementation, likely to be generalizable, likely to have implications for healthcare systems or practice guidelines, um, have important considerations for diversity and health equity in genomic medicine, uh, sufficiently large and rigorous uh, to overcome uh, biases, and are broadly representative of the field beyond NHGRI sponsored or U.S. funded programs. I would note that, you know, not, not every advance has to meet all of these, but we like them to meet, you know, at least a, a few of them. And then we uh, classify them into categories such as a resource uh, pilot implementation or et cetera. Uh, and the criteria for these categories are, are on the website. Um, we also, at the, at the suggestion of one of our members, Pat DeVerka, um, started doing a genomic medicine year in review that the American Journal of Human Genetics uh, expressed interest in accepting as a commentary. And so we've now done four of these where we basically pick sort of the top 10 of the advances that we've identified. This is totally arbitrary. Um, we do it as a vote uh, among the, uh, uh, the working group. But you can see we've, we've done these in, in each of the past four years, the most recent one uh, last December in, in AJ. Uh, we also take a look at the trends in uh, the types of categories or the, the types of papers by category that are being published. For instance, you can see I can find the mouse. It's gone. Never mind. Um, you can see that uh, in purple are shown the, the past three years uh, of uh, number of papers in a given area. In blue is shown the 2022 um, papers. And you can see that genomic medicine resources are becoming much more common, um, at least in terms of the things that we identify as being uh, important accomplishments, um, as is implementation um, and risk assessment. Sequencing has dropped down, et cetera. So, uh, if you uh, have a paper that you feel um, should be in included as a genomic medicine accomplishment, please do send uh, a nomination to us. Sorry that you can't read that uh, very easily. It's gmwg at nih.gov, so it couldn't be simpler. Uh, another thing that the working group does uh, is to plan a, a series of roughly annual genomic medicine meetings. You can see them here. We began in June of 2011 uh, and have proceeded on a variety of topics, um, forming collaborations, physician education, uh, global leaders in genomic medicine, um, genomic medicine uh, clinical decision support, pharmacogenetics, et cetera. Uh, our most recent ones were in February of 2021 in clinical information informatics, and then um, uh, just this past summer, uh, genomic learning healthcare systems. 
products of these meetings uh, have been um, legion, we, we, and we're very proud of, of uh, the planning that has gone into these. So our very first meeting uh, led actually to another very targeted um, workshop led by Aaron Ramos uh, that led to the ClinGen Consortium, um, and it has recently uh, also spawned another uh, collaboration or, or participated in another collaboration, the Gen CC, which recently published a paper. It also um, stimulated our addition of pharmacogenetic testing into to emerge back way in the, the second phase of emerge, so very very early on um, in the process here. Um, the second meeting on collaborations led to our developing the Ignite Consortium, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. I have to skip some of these because uh, there are too many of them to count. Uh, the um, Inter-Society Coordinating Committee on Practitioner Education and Genomics, you just heard about um, in the com Community Education Group, where both of those members are, are participating in, in that group. They're actually having their seventh, I believe, um, uh, in-person meeting uh, coming up on Wednesday, if you want to stick around for that. Um, our sixth one led on global leaders in genomic medicine led to the Global Genomic Medicine Consortium um, and uh, the inter, uh, sorry, the International 100,000 uh, plus cohorts consortium. Both of these are international collaborations to identify uh, groups around the world that are, are uh, doing genomic medicine implementation and um, cohort-based research uh, in genomics um, and have been quite successful as well. Um, let's see. Uh, the eighth one uh, was uh, was sort of an overview of our various programs. We recognized that uh, it would be very helpful uh, to have some educational programs, particularly in modular form, and so that led to that um, uh, notice. Uh, the ninth on uh, bedside back to, bedside to bench and back again. Uh, yes, and back again uh, led to uh, the variant function disease um, uh, program announcement uh, back in 2018. Um, the 10th one, which I've been blocking now on what it was on. Uh, oh, that was the pharmacogenetics one, sorry. Um, and, uh, and that led to the, the ADOPT PGX program in IGNITE. Um, and uh, uh, the 11th and clinical implementation um, led to a, a subsequent meeting on uh, working with employers to incorporate genetic testing into their healthcare programs, something that they were not quite ready for yet, but we had uh, some very good discussions uh, with them that informed some of our subsequent work. The 12th uh, meeting on predicting uh, risk uh, led to the primed consortium as well as um, um, fashioning the fourth phase of the eMERGE network into uh, genomic risk assessment. Um, and as I mentioned, the most recent one uh, on informatics uh, led to a, a, a notice a request for applications for um, patient-centered informatics. Uh, the 14th one um, has just happened, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, all of these meetings are described on our on our website. Uh, actually, they're all listed there. And again, our uh, many thanks to our. Um, um, Colleagues in the in the uh, web uh, team and the communications group who uh, make very detailed and captioned um, uh, uh, videos of all of these meetings available, both live streamed and then archived. Um, our program analysts prepare both an executive summary and a meeting summary, which are available on the website. And there are often publications that come out of these. Um, and just to, to uh, remind you of the uh, the strategic vision, particularly this figure. Uh, so genomic learning healthcare systems were uh, a major, well, uh, an emphasis within the strategic vision, which had a number of emphases. Um, but uh, this this figure really emphasized the uh, the importance of the virtuous cycle of taking new genomic knowledge into quality improvement strategies, applying those in practice, um, collecting data on the outcomes, analyzing those data, and then using that to generate generate new genomic knowledge and new interventions. Uh, so this was something that we, we recognized we really needed to pursue. And so uh, my colleagues, Pat DeVerka and uh, Renee Ryder, um, co-chaired with me our, our 14th meeting, um, which was designed to explore real world real world examples of how genomic learning healthcare systems apply cycles of, uh, as I just described, implementation, evaluation, re-implementation across uh, healthcare delivery systems, look at the barriers and identify potential solutions, um, and uh, uh, focusing also on trying to increase the potential for transportability to other settings, and then determine ways to develop and share these solutions, form collaborations to facilitate research on this. 
Uh, key recommendations from that meeting included um, uh, in, in one group sort of building on and extending the interoperability of methods for integrating genomic data into care in health information exchanges that include genomic information uh, and exchanging those data with other systems, and potentially creating a national learning healthcare system network um, based in genomics to gather data from collaborating uh, genomic learning healthcare systems on practice quality improvement and benchmarking. So that was one area. Uh, a second area uh, suggested suggested creating some kind of a, either a consult service or an expert panel uh, and evaluating its impact uh, to help educate clinicians about, for instance, genetic test ordering, interpretation, determining follow-up and management, those sorts of things, uh, and even potentially developing a learning community of practice, like a listserv or some other form of um, educational opportunity to provide information, updates, uh, potentially supplemented with a panel of experts. For both of these areas, um, uh, promoting equity of implementation in low-resourced and underserved settings uh, was recognized as, as being a priority as well. And it is our hope that we will be bringing you in May um, two concepts, one for the, the uh, Learning Healthcare System Network and another for the consult service and evaluation. To give you an overview of, of what the current genomic medicine uh, portfolio of research looks like, um, based on, on uh, fiscal 22 funds, uh, there is the Undiagnosed Diseases Network um, uh, that's been going on for 10 years. This is a common fund funded program. Uh, it was uh, funded at 16.4 million in fiscal 22 and was slated to end in fiscal 22. Um, a congressional mandate has um, um, continued it into this year, unfortunately without funding, um, so we're scrambling a bit to figure out how to, uh, how to do that, but that is uh, the plan for that one. Um, the CSER program actually was on a continuation. Its funding ended in fiscal 21, but the investigators have been very enthusiastic and also very, very efficient in sort of marshalling their resources, and they are continuing to analyze and publish. You saw some of their, uh, their work in Eric's director's report. The Emerge Network, uh, I, I mentioned just briefly, is currently looking at risk assessment and management tools for clinical use uh, at, at a, about 20 million um, in fiscal 21. The IGNITE Consortium is uh, conducting pragmatic clinical trials, both of uh, APOL1 testing for uh, preventing renal disease and pharmacogenetics for pain and depression treatment at about $10 million. The ClinGen Consortium develops and disseminates consensus information on genes and variants relevant to clinical care. Um, you heard uh, a little bit about the um, uh, added ClinGen curation panels supported by our sister ICs, uh, which establishes expert panels for genes and variants relevant to participating uh, other NIH institutes and centers, uh, and they're contributing nearly half as much as NHGRI is uh, to the ClinGen effort. We have a, a growing uh, investigator-initiated portfolio, um, including the Advancing Genomic Medi Medicine Research, RFA that you heard about a little bit earlier. Uh, there are also uh, emphases on genetic counseling processes and on dissemination and implementation. Uh, and in training, we have a, a portfolio uh, small of training grants, uh, fellowships, and career development. Um, the total uh, genomic medicine funding, uh, as if we add up all, all of these programs, is 96 million. Uh, the 22 million coming from other institutes leaves 74 million, um, supported by NHGRI. 35 percent of that is investigator initiated in fiscal 22. And the total extramural budget of NHGRI in, in um, fiscal 22 was 441 million, so this is about 18 uh, percent genomic medicine. And just to show you the growth in NHGRI funding for genomic medicine research, starting from 2015, it, it actually started before then, but this is where we have good data. And you can see that it's been, been rising um, somewhat, you know, a little bit in, uh, in fits and starts, but that has to do with some programs ending, other programs starting, some loans uh, between different programs, et cetera. Plateauing a little bit currently, um, probably have as, as much as we can, uh, we can handle at the moment, uh, but hoping to continue to grow it in, in future years. Uh, and then this on a, on a slightly expanded scale is the funding for investigator-initiated genomic medicine research, and you can see a steady growth in that uh, over these past uh, several years, and then if you kind of um, superimpose that on the research. So that is growing more rapidly um, than, than the uh, overall uh, commitment to genomic medicine research, and that's shown here in the percent investigator initiated, which in 2015 was barely noticeable um, and now is, is uh, well above 30 percent. 
So with that, I'll be happy to stop and take any questions or comments. Actually, I may um, note that poor Dr. Jarvik uh, is also on the Genomic Medicine Working Group. And uh, Gail, if you, if you had any comments to, to add or things that I left out. Yeah, Terry, I'm attending to the time, uh, but I, I did want to just uh, reemphasize the incredible impact of the annual meetings. And since I joined rather later, I not conflicted by taking credit for some of those. But I think the meetings are uh, particularly strong in saying, where are we? Where do we need to go? What are the knowledge gaps? And then how do we address them? And then I applaud Terry's leadership and then translating those gaps to programs to fill those gaps. And it's been exciting to see that and be part of it. And I really do feel like this is a highly productive group. Thanks. Great. No, thank you, Gail, very much. Uh, I might also call on, call on Dr. Kalu. Um, you, you've participated in some of these programs. Did you want to make any comments? No, I think um, echoing what Gail just said, I think this group uh, has been really extraordinarily, uh, um, I think, uh, what, what should I say, the full of foresight for the for the upcoming, you know, initiatives that are needed. And uh, I think in that graph you showed, Terry, it's incredible to see how many uh, initiatives have come out of those deliberations. So I think congratulations to you and the group uh, for really staying on top of things. Because I think as we saw from the strategic vision when you were gathering input, I think it was clear that NHGRI has to take the lead in genomic medicine. And I think you've really done a wonderful job with that. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Steve has his. Hand up. Yeah, just just one, you know, a couple comments. One is that I could think of no other person better than you to help lead this effort because of all the things that you've been through in your past, <laughs> including the previous institute. I think you know you've really gathered a lot of skill in bringing people together and herding cats. So uh, congratulations on that. But I guess the, the the other question is, in in your learned opinion. Uh, What's next? Great, great question. Um, I think you know we are seeing the the genomic learning healthcare system as as an area that we really need to move into um, in order to to truly evaluate on a large scale the implementation of of genomics and clinical care, and and that's probably um, the the major effort, which is not going to be a short-term thing. Uh, in addition, getting non-geneticist providers to be able to be comfortable with, with applying genomics in their uh, clinical practice, uh, which is one of the things the consult service is designed to do. Um, but, uh, you know, that's another effort that is, is going to take multiple years, and we need to get this into guidelines, into a, into a number, you know, with professional societies and other things. So, so generating that evidence, CSER was designed to generate evidence, as are several of our other programs. And so, so those we see as, as major ones. But I would turn to you and say, you know, where, where do you see gaps and, and where do you think we should be going? Yeah, you know, to, to me, just looking at what's happening with healthcare systems uh, and uh, sort of, I guess, liaisons and then the divorces and then rearrangements, it becomes a little bit of a, of a moving target of how you're going to uh, try to implement genomic medicine in a system where typically it's more or less profit motivated. Um, and it, it seems like genomic medicine at this stage is viewed as a cost and, and, and not something that will help a system differentiate itself from another and gain more patient revenues. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, it, in some places, it is considered something that will help them differentiate themselves, and, and but that's not the reason we see that uh, that they should be they should be doing it. Um, I guess I might also mention something that we we discussed at our most recent in person meeting. We do meet in person once a year. Um, is, is population screening, um, and so finding finding ways to do that uh, in a in a consistent and low cost but effective way, and that's that's a big one. So so we'll probably have a meeting on that uh, coming up in the fall. If Takar is that old, up on, old hand. Yeah, what Terry just said about population screening. And I think there were maybe, um, I don't may not have the dates right, but there were these state screening programs um, maybe three, four decades ago 
Um, I think states like Michigan, um, uh, I think um, on the West Coast, maybe Idaho, I, I forget, but Roger Williams, for example, had this initiative on uh, family screening. So I, I think that uh, what you were just describing about population screening, downstream of that is cascade testing. And I think we are doing very poorly with that. And I think that's a big need. Because if you do population screening, but you don't couple it to cascade screening, you really are uh, not getting the maximal impact. So I think that should be considered mm -hmm. as well. No, thank you, Iftikhar. That's an, an excellent point. And, and one of the, the things we're, we've been struggling with, as have many, um, is, is how does one increase the uptake among families? It's in the best of hands. It's only about 20 percent. Um, and in you know, average, is, is much less than that. And, and that's tough. And you take cost barriers away, and it's still uh, similarly low. So uh, thanks. We'll, we'll try and tackle that one. Uh, Judy? Yeah, uh, just to echo, this is an impressive array of programs that's been developed and the progress has been impressive. Um, just to get back to, to Steve Birch's point about the profit motive, which I brought up a couple of times at this meeting as well, one of the things that actually may be at, at least neutral and maybe save money in the health system is pharmacogenetics. And so Sinai is making that bet. Um, and it's, it's something that you can do well by doing good. Um, and I, I would just throw that out as, as a potential kind of area where you can really leverage this learning health care approach. Mm -hmm. Super. No, thanks for raising that. And, and actually, I might point out, um, when we did our employers meeting, uh, one of the things we heard about was a, a pharmacogenetic management program based in the Kentucky Teachers Retirement System. They recently published their paper. Jarvis is the first author. I've forgotten where it's what, what journal it's in, but, um, but at any rate, uh, showing really substantial savings, I think something like $7,000 per participant. Uh, and there were, you know, thousands of participants. So, so really impressive and participants were happy with it and, and that. So, um, so that's an excellent point uh, that PGX probably really is going to be. And plus the, the recent, um, just in the, Lancet, in the last week, the PREPARE trial from the Ubiquitous Pharmacogenetics uh, Program in, in Europe, um, demonstrating a 30% reduction in adverse drug reactions. 30% um, is really remarkable. That was remarkable. Yeah. The absolute values were 28% to 20%. Mm -hmm. So that was remarkable. Yeah. I agree. Absolutely. Great. I don't think so. Okay. Any last comments for Terry? If not, thank you very much, Terry. Certainly.